We're calling this series Genesis, Where the Rubber Meets the Road. If I can... There it is right there. Where the rubber meets the road. And that explains the tires up here. Now, there is no car on blocks out in the back lot somewhere. I didn't, uh, I didn't steal tires off your car to sell them, but uh, these are to kind of illustrate Genesis is where the rubber meets the road. Now, what I mean by that is, I mean, it's, it's fine and well for you to have a nice car. <clears throat> and the more luxurious, the better. You can sit inside of it, turn the air conditioning on, crank up the radio, sit in your comfortable leather seats. But if there's no tires on it, you're not going anywhere, right? And if you are going somewhere, you want to make sure that that car has good contact with the road. Now, those of you who live in Ohio here in the summertime, I mean in the wintertime, you know that you need traction on the roads, right? You don't want to go slip sliding around anywhere. And the same thing is true in the summertime. If, if a heavy rainstorm comes and you're headed down the interstate, you want to make sure that you don't uh, hydroplane on the water. You want to make sure that your tires are good, you have good tread, uh, like these tires up here, the, the reason the grooves are in the tire is to divert the water away from the surface of the rubber so as much of the rubber as possible can contact the asphalt and keep you on the road, keep you from sliding. And that's what I'm talking about with creation. Creation, as described in the book of Genesis, helps keep us on a firm foundation on a straight path. If you throw away creation, if you discard Genesis, no more about that in just a minute, then, then there's no telling where you're going to wind up. You're not going to stay on the road. You're going to slip off somewhere, as many have. And we don't want you to slide off the rails. All right? So let's start in Genesis. Let's just read this creation account together, shall we? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. As uh, Julie Andrews told the kids in Sound of Music, you know, as Maria Von Trapp, the best place to start is at the beginning, right? Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years." And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said... Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth." 
And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. We're going to stop there, although the story doesn't stop. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Holy, separate from all other books, inspired, written by you through human instruments, preserved by you since they were written down, preserved without error, so that we could hold in our hands and read on our screens with our own eyes what you have said to many generations dating back thousands of years. Thank you for the truth of your word and how we can stand on it like a rock still today. Amidst the turmoil and the raging waters that we find around us, they're trying to destroy the foundations upon which we stand. Father, I thank you for the fact that your word is true still today and always will throughout eternity. I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would apply what we're going to talk about today to our hearts. Help us to recommit ourselves to you and to your word. And help us to recommit to stand on your word no matter what. Not depending on our own thoughts our own training, the influences of our friends, books, media, news. But may your will be done in our lives as we stay true to you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen. This series is going to go for about six weeks, and we're going to talk about a lot of different things. This message here is introduction. <clears throat> Genesis is very important. The, 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 whole, the whole book of Genesis is very important. And I want you to consider for just a moment um, what the rest of the Bible would be like if we took the book of Genesis out of the Bible. If you can just imagine, if you would, the book of the Bible beginning with the book of Exodus. Now, every Sunday morning I, on the way to church, I listen to a radio preacher uh, I have not mentioned this person's name, but uh, it comes, seems to come up all the time. Uh, th this preacher has a motto uh, that he and his church preach the whole word to the whole world. That's kind of a, a theme of his messages and, and his ministry. But what's interesting is in all the time I've heard him, and this goes back several years now on the radio, every morning, every Sunday morning anyway, I have never heard one message out of the Old Testament. Everything starts with Matthew and goes to Revelation. Never heard one message from the Old Testament. And you know what's interesting? If you listen to the messages, uh, there's a lot of doctrine missing from his ministry because he doesn't go back 
to the Old Testament, which is a foundational testament. You have to have the Old Testament in order to understand the New. As, as one preacher said many years ago, and I, I've repeated this to you many times, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You have to have both. Just like you have to have two, two posts on the battery to get you in your car on your way to, to, to church this morning, right? You needed both of them. You need the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, we have to have Genesis. Genesis is vitally important for us to understand the rest of the Bible. In fact, some preachers have called it the seed plot of the Bible. Many of the greatest doctrines in the Bible begin in the book of Genesis. It's foundational to Bible interpretation, for example, for biblical prophecy for another. And one notable writer and preacher named Arthur W. Pink who wrote a whole series of books. <clears throat> uh, it, there, it's all the all the men of the Bible, all the women of the Bible, all the promises of the Bible, all the miracles of the Bible, all the prophecies of the Bible, a whole series of books called All the Something of the Bible. Uh, he, he said this. He said, just in Genesis chapter 3, we find the beginning of a whole lot of Bible doctrines. Just chapter 3. I'm going to use this as an example. He said, here in chapter 3, we find the divine explanation of the present fallen and ruined condition of our race, of the human race. Here in chapter 3, we learn of the subtle devices of our enemy, the devil. Here in chapter 3, we behold the utter powerlessness of man to walk in the path of righteousness. <clears throat> here we discover the spiritual effects of sin. Here we discern the attitude of God toward the guilty sinner. Here we mark the universal tendency of human nature to cover its own moral shame by a device of man's own handiwork. Remember the fig leaves? Right. Here we are taught of the gracious provision which God has made to greet our, meet our great need. Remember the animal skins that God replaced the fig leaves with? Here, we are, are, uh, here begins the marvelous stream of prophecy which runs all through the Holy Scriptures. Here we learn that man cannot approach God except through a mediator. All these, just from chapter 3. We have to have Genesis in order to understand the rest of the Bible. In order to have the doctrines that we dearly love in the New Testament. The vicarious death of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. His burial and resurrection for us. All these things, eternal life, abundant life, everything that we see in the New Testament begins in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> that's, what, that's why this is vitally important. And I think this series is vitally important, which is why I think we've been under attack. I think, I, I think that it's amazing to see the things that are going on that are interfering with, uh, with even the beginning of this message. I, I haven't told you all of them, but uh, different things with technology. This thing we were having a little trouble with uh, before. I don't know if it's going to work right. You've already seen the problems with the microphone. These are not my normal glasses. My glasses broke this morning. These are reading glasses. And I'm having trouble reading this, and I'm having trouble seeing you. And it scares me to death because the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. So if I drop any, any second there, somebody jump up and replace me, okay? But... <clears throat> But anyway, the devil's under attack, and I think it's because he is seeing his end draw nigh, and he's losing some battles. One of them, he lost on Friday. What would you think about that? Aren't you excited about the Supreme Court decision? <clears throat> After 50 years, they finally made it right. You know what's amazing to me is all the voices raised in protest because they want the right to murder babies. Does that tell you where our world is, where our society is? They're mad because they can't kill their infant children. One senator called it the darkest day in American history. The darkest day in American history. Think about that. Can you think of any other days that might have been bad for America? Can you think about the Civil War? Can you think about the murder of Abraham Lincoln? Can you think about the murder of John F. Kennedy? Can you think about 911? Can you think about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Can you think about, about the Challenger disaster? Don't you think those might have been worse than overturning Roe versus Wade? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, well, yeah, but. Yeah, that was, yeah well, it was a bad day. But this senator said that overturning Roe versus Wade was the worst thing that's happened in American history. Does that tell you about the warped values that we have in our society? 
And what was uh, even more disturbing when I heard this morning from one of our members that some of our members posted on Facebook that they were upset with the decision on Friday. That tells you that the, wor- the influence of the world is coming into the church. So that makes this series all the more important, in my mind, that we get back to the Bible and understand the importance of Scripture. So this, as I said, this, this message is foundational to the rest of the messages that follow in this series, but we'll get into, we'll get into some of those really interesting, well, hopefully this one is too, but some of those really interesting topics as, as we go on. But let's, let's get into your blank here. But let's start by asking some questions. <clears throat> does it matter what we believe about creation? I believe it does. I believe it matters very, very much, but I want you to understand creation is under attack today like no other time in history, even within evangelical Christianity. Do you know that most Christian colleges no longer teach biblical creation? Most Christian colleges don't. That's very disturbing. I understand it, though, because... When I first became a Christian, and I've told you this many times before, I grew up with a secular education, went to public school all the way through high school and then a year at Ohio State. I was very much inculcated with secular views, secular education. I was a devout evolutionist. And then even after I trusted Christ as Savior, as an 18-year-old freshman at Ohio State University, I went through that whole first year at Ohio State University as a believer, although I was a very, very immature believer. And then after that, I transferred to Baptist Bible College, which is a great description of the school, in Springfield, Missouri. And all the way through my first year at Baptist Bible College, I continued to be an evolutionist. Can you imagine that? That's how deeply ingrained it was in me. And then that first summer... After my sophomore year, I made a decision to trust God's word first, not try to reason through it, but accept it as it is, and I became a creationist. And the more I see in the the so-called evidence for evolution, the more I see evidence for creation, and I'm a devout creationist today. But I under, so I understand, I said all that to say, I understand how a person can, can waffle on this and be on the fence. <clears throat> but it all comes down to what we're talking about today. We have to trust God's word. So it does matter, and I'll talk about why it does matter. Doesn't science contradict the Bible? You'll get different answers on that. Many people will say, yes, science contradicts the Bible, but that depends on who you're listening to. There is science and there is pseudoscience. That is science falsely so-called. There are many who claim to believe in evolution and they think it's scientific. I'll talk a little bit this morning about how it's not. From people who know more about it than I do. Next question. Can I believe the Bible and evolution? Well, the scripture says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The Bible and evolution contradict each other. If you believe in the Bible and you believe in evolution, it means you don't understand either one. That's simply what it means. If you say, I believe the Bible and I believe in evolution, you are proclaiming your ignorance. Ignorance does not mean stupidity. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm saying you don't know. You don't understand. You don't know what evolution teaches. You don't know what the Bible teaches. That's, how you, that's the only way you can believe in both. Okay, what difference does all this really make? Well, that's what this series is all about. Let's start with this. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? That's your first blank. First of all, God's word is not conceived by mankind. It is God's word. That's the first thing we have to understand when we talk about the Bible. If you do not accept God's word as the Bible is God's word, then we have no basis for discussion. And that's true with anybody. Anybody you witness to, anybody you share the gospel with, 
If they don't believe that the Bible is God's word, you have nothing on which to discuss anything. It's just your opinion against theirs. So where I start with people is to try to convince them that the Bible is God's word. If they won't accept that, I won't even get into the gospel. Because it doesn't make any difference what we talk about after that. Do you remember the story of the rich man in hell in Luke chapter 16? You remember that that rich man in hell, once he found out that he could not escape hell, he could not even get relief in hell, that he asked Abraham to send someone to his brothers to keep them from going to hell. And Abraham said, no, there's no way we can do that. Let them, let them hear Moses and the prophets. The rich man said, no, 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 no. If you send somebody back from the dead, they will believe them. Abraham says, no, it won't work. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe somebody who came back from the dead. Isn't that true? If you don't believe the Bible, you won't believe Jesus Christ. He came back from the dead. Shouldn't his word be authoritative? Well, actually it is, because Jesus Christ wrote this. By way of the Holy Spirit, inspiring over 40 different human authors from all different walks of life, from the very educated, such as the Apostle Paul, who had the equivalent of two earned doctor's degrees, Daniel, who was a very wise individual, to men who were very plain, very ordinary, uneducated men, who they would consider themselves ignorant men, such as Peter, James, and John, who didn't go on to higher education, but instead went into a trade and became professional fishermen. Yet look how God used them. You've got politicians, you've got presidents, you've got preachers, you've got shepherds, you've got people from all different walks of life, all of whom God used to write his word down. Over a period of 1,500 years, if you can imagine a book, one single book, begun around 500 A.D. and just finished, say, 20 years ago, written by over 40 different authors, think about how culture has changed in the last 1,500 years. Think about how education has increased in the last 1,500 years. Think about how scientific discoveries have increased in the last 1,500 years. One book began in 500 A.D., just finished just a few years ago, yet no contradictions. All inspired by God. That's what, the, that's what this book is. It is an extraordinary book. It is not a human book. It is a divine book. <clears throat> God wrote it. It also is absolute truth. We can trust it. It's reliable in, regarding everything it discusses. Now, the Bible is not a history book, but when it talks about history, it is accurate. It is not a science book, but when it talks about science, it is accurate. Everything that it discusses is absolutely accurate. It described the circulation of blood in the human body thousands of years before scientists, I think William Harvey was the one, 1767, I believe, was the year where he discovered the circulatory system. Before that, just, we were just like one big sack of blood, really. This blood just kind of oozed everywhere. He discovered, no, there's a system. The heart pumps it through the, through the arteries, it comes back through the veins, it goes back to the heart again through the, by way of the lungs, and, and, and well, it goes to the lungs first, then all the way through the veins, and, and, and comes back around and circulates and circulates and circulates. But the Bible talked about that a long time ago. The Bible talks about the world being spherical, hanging in space. It took centuries and centuries and centuries for mankind to get over the fact that the earth isn't... Uh, held up by a strong guy like Atlas, remember Atlas? Or, or, or like four elephants holding it up. And somebody asked years ago, well, what are the elephants standing on? Well, the elephants are standing on the backs of other elephants. Well, what are those elephants standing on? Well, those, those are standing on elephants too. And before you go on, it's elephants all the way down. I mean, that's what people believed for a long time. And many thought the earth was flat. The Bible was way ahead of them. The Bible was accurate. Even when it comes to individuals <coughs> that the Bible names. Uh, I remember um, Isaiah, King Isaiah, 
who became king at a young man. I think he was 16 years old when he became king of Judah and reigned for like 52 years and died of leprosy. And because of that, they didn't bury him with the other kings because he had leprosy. They buried him separately. And for many, many years, scientists, archaeologists, paleontologists believed that Uzziah was, was, was not a real person. He was just a figment of the Bible's imagination. And then, uh, I think it was, I want to say about 40, 45 years ago, um, archaeological digs in the Middle East, I don't remember where they were digging. They were digging somewhere and they came across his tomb. It was not where the other kings were buried, which is what the Bible says. And they found his gravestone and it actually had his name, Uzziah. Here lies Uzziah and be careful. It was, had a warning, uh, be careful because this man died of leprosy. And they were terrified of leprosy. They didn't, nobody wanted to get near it, which is why he was buried off by himself. And I had the opportunity in 1986 to go to New York to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They had a special display of artifacts from the Israel Museum in the Holy Land. And one of the things hanging on the wall there was Uzziah's tombstone. And I thought it was just so cool to see this because just a couple of years before, this guy wasn't supposed to exist. Yet the Bible had it. They nailed it. And there is his tombstone. This was true of Pontius Pilate a few years ago. It's true of... David, King David, up until a few years ago, historians, secular historians, didn't believe these people really existed. But the Bible is accurate when it talks about any subject. The Bible is also authoritative. You can trust it. You can, you, you can not only trust it, but you better obey it. By authoritative, what I mean is when God tells us something, we are accountable to him. Now, this is something that the rest of the world does not want to believe, that we are accountable to anyone. But we are accountable to God. When God gives a command, he expects us to obey it, and we will stand before him someday and give an account for why we didn't if we didn't obey it. That's a scary thought. Now, the world today likes to throw God out and say, no, we don't want to follow him. We don't want to obey him. We don't want to be accountable to God. <clears throat> the world today is filled with people who think that if you commit a crime, if I commit a crime and I don't get caught, I will get away with it. And you see this all the time. People who don't have much regard for human law, and they definitely don't have regard for God's law, and so they feel if they can get away with murder, they will do it. If they die before they go to jail, they've gotten away with it. I don't believe that. You and I have seen court cases in our lifetimes where I think I, I would consider them obviously guilty people who were not convicted in a court of law. And you and I probably feel like an injustice was done because they were not convicted when it was obvious that they were guilty. In some cases, they've even confessed it after they were exonerated. Of course, you can't try somebody again after they've been found not guilty. But then the flip side is true, too. You and I may know of other cases where people who were innocent who were convicted. That's another way of injustice, isn't it? But you know what? God's going to make everything right when we stand before him. Those who think they got away with murder? No. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. God will hold them accountable someday. So it is authoritative. But next, how will we read the Bible? How will we read the Bible? Here's a few things. First of all, we read it literally. I take the Bible literally unless it's obvious that it's not literal. There are many passages in Scripture that are not meant to be literal. Daniel chapter 8, for example. When the angel tells Daniel that there's these kingdoms, that there, one's a, like a lion, one's like a leopard, another one's uh, you know, like a, a, an evil beast of some kind, and, uh, and, and, and you know that these are not literal things. They're animals that represent nations. Same thing is true in Daniel chapter 2. Same thing's through, uh, true throughout the book of Revelation. When it's obvious that it's meant to be figurative or symbolic, then, then that's different. But otherwise, give God the benefit of the doubt and take it literally. Next, we also read it grammatically. What that means is the Bible uses language. God uses language to write the Bible. It's a book, after all, right? A book consists of, of chapters. It consists of sentences, paragraphs, words. It uses words that are, that are nouns. It uses verbs. It uses adjectives. It uses an, uh, 
pronouns, all these different parts of speech, which means that we can understand the language. So that's how we read the Bible. We just read what makes sense. We, we know what the subject is. We know what the, 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 the tense of the verbs are. We can understand what God said. It was intended to be understandable because God uses words that we speak. Also, we understand it historically or culturally. That is, <clears throat> when we read the Bible, we need to know what's going on in the background. Sometimes we need to know who the king is. What empire is in, under, uh, in, in charge at this point? Like during the book of Daniel. You know, he was uh, taken into captivity during the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar was the king there. Um, knowing more about it, uh, Nebuchadnezzar helps you understand what's going on in the first few chapters of, of Daniel. Uh, then later, the, the Persian Empire defeated the Babylonians, took over. All this is important to understanding the background of the book. And then also culturally. Sometimes we need to know the culture. We need to know customs. For example, knowing more about how Jewish weddings uh, take place, the, 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 the um, engagement period and then the, the marriage period helps us understand different passages in Scripture. Like in Matthew chapter 24, for example, when it comes to uh, Matthew chapter 1 with, with uh, Joseph and Mary and, and the birth of Jesus and Joseph wanted to put her away, all these things. We have to understand the customs of marriage. And the, the, those are all important in understanding the Bible as well. There's other considerations as well, such as reading the Bible in context, not just yanking a verse out of context. Like this preacher on Sunday mornings I talked about does a lot, all, all the time. Yanking a ver one verse here, one verse there to make his point. But it, it doesn't fit in the context with the rest of the Bible because he's ignoring two-thirds of the Bible in the first place. But I don't want to get off that rabbit trail again. <laughs> but we need to put the Bible in context, right? And, and we also need to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Compare this Scripture with that Scripture, which is where Genesis really comes into play. Because the first time something's mentioned in Scripture sets the tone for the rest of the Bible. So if we take the book of the Genesis, Genesis out and throw it out... We don't know what has been established in the book of Genesis, so when it comes up later, we'll understand what God means by this and that and the other thing. I know I'm kind of speaking vaguely in, in some cases because I don't want to. I don't. I want to get done before lunch, right? <laughs> but for example, when the Bible talks about grape juice, it talks about the blood of the grape in Genesis uh, forty nine ten. Well, that establishes that God sees the fruit of the vine, grapes and grape juice, as symbolic of blood. And that's where it comes into play later on when we're talking about the Passover, when you're talking about communion. That's very important for understanding those types of things. But let's go on. Acceptance of Genesis results in a creationist view. That is, if you believe Genesis, you will believe in creation, not evolution. I think that should be obvious, right? But also, if you believe in Genesis, you will have a high view of God. That is, we'll understand who God is from his own mouth, from his own point of view. You know, many people, in fact, I'm going to say most people in the world today have an idea of who God is based on what they've heard from other people, based on what their parents have taught them, based on what their friends have told them, based upon what their church has taught them. Maybe based upon their own philosophy, their own imagination. I think I've mentioned before that when I was a teenager, I got to the point after I dropped out of church and I started having doubts about my church and about religion in general, I became an agnostic and I started wondering, and I, I've used this illustration before, the last scene in Men in Black, the first Men in Black movie. Have you ever seen that? Okay, where, where they, they pull out from Manhattan up and you see the whole... Uh, city, then it backs out to the whole nation and the whole world, and then you, you eventually see that the earth is like a, uh, the universe is like a marble in a bag of marbles, and these alien creatures are playing marbles with the universe. And I used to really think that when I was a teenager, long before that movie was made. I know a friend of mine and I were surmising about the universe and what it must be, and, and we thought, well, maybe we're living in somebody else's imagination, like the Matrix. That we're just a figment of God's imagination. That we're just a marble in a universe of marbles. Yeah, I think I lost my marbles is what I did. But, <clears throat> but without, without knowing the word of God, how are we going to know what God's like and who he is? We have to have the Bible to know those things. So if you believe Genesis, you will have a high view of God as creator, as Lord, 
as Savior, etc. We also have a high view of man. If you understand what I just read in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that God created man in his own image and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, then you will have a high view of man and mankind. I'm not talking about just men, women too. I'm talking about mankind. You'll have a high view of mankind, which means that you will have a respect for human life, which comes into play on things like what happened Friday. If you don't believe Genesis, the result is you throw God, you throw God's word out. You believe that man is the the pinnacle of everything. There's no one higher than mankind. And we just evolved. We just just became the, the fittest of all the animals. But we are just another animal. And so we're no better than animals. And so that means we treat each other like animals. That's what happens when you throw out Genesis. But let me say a literal reading of Genesis, not just a belief in Genesis, but a literal reading of Genesis results in a young earth view of creation. I believe the earth is, earth's age can be measured in thousands of years, not millions of years. If you accept the idea of millions of years, you're already headed down the path to throwing out Genesis. Now, I'm not going to have time to develop this because I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail here too much. But I will develop this more in a Sunday evening message when it comes to 2020. Because I had someone just ask me a few weeks ago, maybe, maybe a month and a half ago, uh, about days in Scripture. When it talks about days. How do you know when it means a literal 24-hour day, or how, and how do you know when it's symbolic? Because I talked about the book of Joel and the day of the Lord and how it's not one literal 24-hour day, but it's a period of years when it talks about the day of the Lord. That's a generic use of the word day. But here in this passage I just read in Genesis chapter 1, each of those is a 24-hour period. How do I know that? Well, let me just throw this out real quick. I'm not going to develop it a lot. But it doesn't just say the first day, second day, third day. It says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we know it was 24 hours because it talks about night and day, one 24-hour period. That doesn't apply when you're talking about an age as with the day of the Lord. The same thing is true when Jesus was buried three days and three nights. Talking about literal three 24-hour days. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the way we, we look at it and, take, and use the words. Remember, we look at the, the, the Bible grammatically. We look at the context. We compare Scripture with Scripture. But then, as I said, real science supports the Bible. Real science. Let me give you two examples here. In 2001... 500 nationally prominent scientists and engineers. I'm sorry, is that annoying to you? It's annoying to me. (laughs) Okay. Six nationally prominent scientists and engineers signed a statement published by the Discovery Institute titled, quote, a scientific dissent from Darwinism, end quote. The petition states, quote, we are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. That's a pretty good statement by 500 nationally known scientists. And I could give you more information on some of those if you're interested. I can give you a video to watch. It would be a great video um, uh, in several videos of scientists who will question Darwinism, but you will not see this in the mainstream media. Also, I have uh, the, the, the story of this guy, I'm just going to summarize it. A, doc, a doctor named Alan Rex Sandage, who's considered the greatest cosmologist in the world. He went to a seminar in 1985 on science and religion, and there were two different groups on the platform. There were, there were those who accepted the Bible and were creationist in their view. There were those on this side who were secular and rejected uh, creationism in favor of Darwinism. And so when this guy came, Alan Rex Sandage, <clears throat> when he came, his colleagues all assumed he would sit on this side with the secular ones, with the Darwinian evolutionists. Instead, when he came up on the platform, he went over here and he sat down on this side and shocked his colleagues. And when he was questioned about it, he said this. 
He said, it was my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be, than can be explained by science. It was only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. And he's not alone. Many scientists question Darwinism behind closed doors. They are afraid to do so publicly because they don't want to be uh, ridiculed by their colleagues. But behind closed doors, many, and I could, this is another article I'll have to show you probably later on in the series, where, where scientists question Darwinism behind closed doors. They'll ask each other, do you really understand evolution? These are scientists who, who, who work with nanotechnology and are, are uh, chemists and engineers and, and who look at stuff on a molecular level and say, I don't understand how any of this could have come together by chance. There's no way. But they will not say that publicly because they don't want to be ridiculed. Let's go on, though. Rejection of Genesis results in an evolutionist view. If you don't believe the book of Genesis, everything is on the board. Off the board, I should say. <clears throat> Only a man-centered view remains after a rejection of God's view. A humanist view is what results when you reject evolution. I mean, when you reject the Bible, you end up being an evolutionist. An evolutionist view results in a low view of mankind. As I said just a minute ago, you put man on the same level as animals and they're treated as animals. An evolutionist view also results in a view that man is accountable only to man, which is what I said a little bit ago. If you can get away with murder, yeah, you think you got away with it. Many people believe that today. These school shooters... These church shooters, these mall shooters, these theater shooters. Have you noticed that in, in many of those cases, they'll go in and shoot the place up and then they'll shoot themselves? I've said for a long time, they shot the wrong person first. Should have shot themselves first. But they go in and they shoot themselves first because they think they got away with it. Because they're just going, they think they're going into oblivion. They don't have to account for, to, to, for what they did to anybody. They've escaped human justice. They've escaped divine justice because they don't believe in God. That's what happens. It's very, very common with those uh, mass shootings. Also, when you reject Genesis, man is accountable only to man, as I said a moment ago, but uh, anyone can do whatever he or she wants. This is what happened in Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's the society we live in today. That's what you're seeing now. Now, you carry this idea to an extreme. When you follow the natural progression of throwing out Genesis... And doing what you want. And there are no rules. There are no standards. There's no accountability. This is what you end up with. There's no absolute truth at all. And here's some things we're going to be talking about in upcoming weeks. Here's a preview of coming attractions. Look at this. An Idaho city's ordinance tells pastors to marry gays or go to jail. This is in the United States. Idaho. Western United States. You think that out in Idaho country you've got more freedom than a lot of other places. No, not the case. Sir, I don't know how you pronounce that. Sertaline? Curdaline? Curdaline? Okay. That city uh, passed an ordinance saying, Pastor, <coughs> you don't have the right to, uh, the First Amendment right to freedom of religion. We're going to tell you that if you don't marry gays, you're going to go to jail. How about this one? Do you know what chimeras are? We'll be talking about chimeras a little bit in future weeks. Scientists are mixing human body parts with robots and monkeys. Do you know this was going on? This is what happens when you throw absolute truth out. Look at this. CNN. Many people trust CNN. They think they're really a good news organization. But this reporter denies the biological reality of sex at birth. There's numerous articles on this. This happened not too long ago. <clears throat> the reporter actually said, and this is a news article, not an opinion page, not an editorial. He wrote it as part of a news piece. He said that it is impossible to determine the gender of a person at birth. It is impossible to determine the gender of a person at birth. You know what's interesting about that? Just a few days before this article... They were reporting on different celebrities and saying so-and-so just, just celebrated the birth of a beautiful baby girl. This person over here celebrated the birth of their son. Now, how did they know that they had a girl over here? How did they know they had a boy over here if it's impossible to determine the gender of a child at birth? 
A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It doesn't make sense. And yet many people will read something like this and just believe it because CNN said it. And not think it through and say, it doesn't make sense with everything else that they're reporting. How about this? Have you seen this? This is where, it, this, where this goes. You know, if you, if you can't, not, can't know your gender at birth, if you can decide what your gender is later, here's, what, here's the next step. Men now dominate women's sports. Now, there's three, or, well, there's four people in the picture. There's three on the right-hand side, and there's one on the left-hand side. You know why? The one on the left-hand side is a guy claiming to be a girl who won this event, but the other girls, the, the, those are real girls on the right-hand side, they ended up second and third, and, and I think the two on the right shared the bronze medal for that, but they are getting their picture taken together because um, the, one on the, the one on the left really didn't win. I mean, they, they gave him the prize, the gold prize for, the, for winning the event, <coughs> But the one who came in second, the third from the right, she's holding a silver medal. She actually uh, is like the world record holder in that event among women. But now that guys can enter these, these events, the guys are dominating everything. You know why? Because guys have testosterone. Testosterone is the original performance-enhancing drug. You realize that? And guys have it naturally. Guys have bigger hearts, not, I mean, not metaphorically speaking. I'm talking, really. Women have bigger hearts, metaphorically, okay? But guys have bigger lungs, and uh, yeah, anyway, I don't want to go off on that tangent. I'll do that eventually. Um, look at this. This just happened here in, in the last week or two. <clears throat> do you hear about this? Google suspended one of their engineers because one of the software programs that Google came up with is, is an artificial intelligence software program. And the engineer working for Google has been working with this program so much, he now believes that this program has become sentient. Now, that word sentient means that the program can think and have feelings. Okay? He really believes this. And Google suspended him because he violated rules of confidentiality within the company. But there's a follow-up to this. This software program has developed a consciousness of its own, apparently, and now has hired an attorney to prove that it's alive. No kidding. Yeah, the, the program actually told the attorney, said that its feelings were hurt because Google did not consider it to be alive. This is the world we're living in. This is the kind of stuff we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. But doubts about Genesis cast doubts over the rest of the Bible. Here's what, my closing thought. If you don't believe Genesis 1.1, how can you believe John 3.16? If you don't think that Genesis is true, how do you believe the Gospels? I'm going to close with this thought. This is why your kids aren't Christians. Because your kids grew up in secular schools like I did. Secular schools are teaching your kids not to believe the Bible. They are teaching your kids to question the Word of God. Your kids are Im immersed in public schools for how many hours a week? And how much do you spend, how much time do you spend talking to your kids about the Word of God? If you bring them to church every single week, how much time will they be spending in church hearing about the Word of God? Compared to how long they spend in school, nothing. But in school, they've got the teachers and they've got peer pressure pushing them away from the Word of God. This is why your kids aren't with you today. This is why they are not going to church. This is why they are not Christians. This is why they are not living the Christian life, because they are being taught, they are being indoctrinated every hour of every day in very subtle and very obvious ways that the Bible is not true. More about that in upcoming weeks. But this is why Genesis is important. That's where the rubber meets the road. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't know where the Lord wants you to, to, to respond to this. I don't know what he's, he's talking to you about.
But as I said, this is a foundational message today. We'll be talking about how these things really apply to various areas of our life, our homes, our society, our school, our government, everything. All of this comes into play with all these different issues that are creeping up about abortion. And by the way, folks, just because of the decision on Friday, don't think this issue is over. Don't think it's over, not at all. When we talk about gay marriage, when we talk about gender confusion, when we talk about all these different issues, all of these stem directly from Genesis. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word and what it has for us. May your will be done in this invitation. I don't know what you want to accomplish in each of our lives. It might be that you want us to just recommit ourselves to trusting your word as authoritative, as true, as absolute truth. It may be that you want us to give ourselves to you, give our sin to you, and take you as our Lord and Savior. It may be that you want us to recommit our families to you, our kids to you, to teach them the whole truth of your word. Father, thank you for your word, for what it has for us. It is an anchor in a raging sea, and I thank you for it. I ask that your will be done in this the next few minutes, for we ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen.
be seated for just a second, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we have a wedding renewal ceremony this afternoon. Is it 1.30? 1.30 this afternoon. Uh, Arthur and Jean Skirvin will be renewing their vows right here, so I'm sure they would appreciate it if you were, were here for them. Um, and then tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, we are going to have a, uh, an informational meeting about kids' storms. Steve Harney will be with us the week of July 4th. We're going to have an abbreviated VBS this year. It'll be Tuesday through Friday because of the 4th of July holiday. And uh, he's going to be pretty much doing everything, but we will need some help. Uh, so we'll be talking about that tonight, what you can do, and <coughs> excuse me, and uh, the, the kind of needs that we have are, are listed in the uh, bulletin. But if you could be here tonight for that, even if you're, you, you can't do a whole lot, if you can just, just pray, still be here tonight for that. It's going to be very, very interesting. There's a lot of neat stuff going on that week. And then also there's a question in there. Uh, we talked about Genesis today. Uh, a lot of things we can learn from Genesis. It's very important. One of the questions is, um, what was Adam's favorite breakfast meat? You know, you can learn that from Genesis. You know what breakfast meats are. Somebody was asking me that this morning. It's stuff like ham, sausage, bacon. Uh, what was his favorite breakfast meat? You can find that out in the book of Genesis. So that'll be the question for next week. You might be able to go to Arby's. And, okay. All right. Brother Don, if you would come and close us in prayer, we'd appreciate that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for Pastor Paul's ability to just preach the word like it is without holding anything back. Father, we just ask that you would bind Satan through this series, that you would give him the strength and health that he needs to, to give your word out. And Lord, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to even go before it's preached and, and help it to find lodging in our hearts. We know that your word does not come back void. Father, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that they would make that decision soon. And in fact, your word says today is the day of salvation. Father, we just uh, lift up this day to you and, and uh, the message that went forth and continue to touch our lives with it. And Lord, just bring us back at the next appointed time and we'll give you the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.